My paper is based on a study of people who participated on both sides in the Civil War and did not fall out. Now, East Limerick particularly is lucky. I think that um, uh, taking the people uh, at, the at the day of the truth, only one significant character, as far as I could see, um, held, dare I say it, a civil war bitterness. All the rest of them, virtually all the rest uh, of the key characters, say, the tragic civil war, and I call it that, uh, uh, threatened to break out from the signing of the truce, effectively, or signing of the treaty, up to the time it actually broke out uh, at the end of June 1922. Now, the first, dare I say it, flashpoint where it nearly happened was in Limerick in March 1922. But three men, uh, Donegal Hannigan, Michael Brennan, and Liam Lynch got together and they cobbled an agreement. Now, it is significant that O'Hannigan and Lynch came from the same parish, almost from the same townland. There was a, a close, um, you know, say, bond between the Lynch family and um, O'Hannigan. Lynch was not involved in the uh, volunteers up to 1916. Um, but when O'Hannigan's brother, um, Donald Hannigan, who had been very involved in 1916 in County Louth, and when he came back home to his own place, he was on the run from the police. And Lynch actually stood guard on Donald Hannigan. Now, that is say, that's probably not very well known, but it actually happened. Now, from that point on, Lynch got involved with the volunteers. And at the end of the Civil War, or at the end of the War of Independence, he was the OC of the 1st Southern Division, which was by a long way the biggest unit of the IRA. Anyhow, um, the, which took the sting out of what might have uh, erupted. Um, Brennan and Lynch were not impacted. O'Hannigan was. From that point on, O'Hannigan's standing with the Free State was in question. Now, he was, there I say it, the most successful flying office, flying column commander to go uh, pro-treaty. But in essence, he never went anywhere in the um, Free State Army. Uh, as I said, this, the ceasefire agreed by the three lads was reputed by the Free State authorities in Dublin. They sent down a guy called Dermot McManus, and he kind of um, uh, turned it, you know, he uh, cancelled the agreement. Um, it follows on in the day of 1922, uh, O'Hannigan. Uh, had taken possession of uh, their castle, and they were surrounded by Republicans. Now, um, really, they could sh should have been, they could have been annihilated. But Lynch, through the officers of Liam D.C., allowed O'Hannigan and his men to march out with their arms on condition that they gave up the position they were holding. Again, as I say, this emphasised with the uh, Free State authorities um, that Lynch or that uh, O'Hannigan couldn't be totally trusted. Um, now, the other thing was that uh, around the same time, uh, when O'Hannigan went away to get married in the summer of 1922, he handed over the East Limerick Brigade to Seamus Malone. Now, Seamus Malone is the older brother of Tom Malone. Both Malones, uh, who are from County Westmeath, operated in the Limerick area. Um, Seamus was the in, in, head of intelligence, and Tom was um, very involved in the flying column. Um, 
when the two boys, as I said, when, when uh, O'Hannigan handed over to Malone, uh, uh, they agreed that they would meet up again when O'Hannigan came back after his, after his funny moon or honeymoon or whatever you want to call it. Um, but the two boys found that uh, when the when Hannigan came back, they were on opposite sides on the Civil War. But um, Malone, in fairness, spoke of the parting with great sadness. There was no rancor. Um, the next thing that happened that I'm alluding to is uh, an East Limerick uh, Free State unit based in a barracks near Carrick and Leash. Now the RIC barracks in Carrick and Leash was burned during the Civil War, so they took over a big house just outside Carrick and Leash called Roses. And the, uh, there were six officers and about 30 uh, soldiers. Now, dare I say it should be known, they went in the lash one night, and the Republicans knew about it. So they came in and captured the barracks. Now, they had no place to hold the uh, 20 or so uh, army soldiers, so they left them off. But they took the six officers. Now, the six officers that I know of, well, five of them I know of, Liam Hayes, Sean Lynch, John Joe O'Brien, Joe Graham. Now, Joe Graham lived in Anacotti, and I interviewed Joe Graham uh, in real life back in the 1980s. Uh, Michael Berkeley, and someone else that I don't, don't know. Um, the six officers were taken to Tipperary Barracks. And um, while they were in the barracks, Sean Hogan came into the room they were staying in. And there was an exchange of pleasantries, if you could so call it, between Hogan and John Joe O'Brien. And uh, Hogan ignored O'Brien. And O'Brien said to him, said, Jesus, Hogan, he said, if I realised you were as big a bee as you are, I'd never have gone to, not long to risk my neck rescuing you. And he said, there was no love lost between the two. <coughs> um, the six officers then were taken uh, to court as prisoners of war, but really they were hostages. Um, now, when uh, Cork was invaded from the sea in August 1922, there was a serious danger that the six spies would be executed in reprisal. So Dan Breen stepped in. Now, there's a lot said against Dan Breen. He's often been described as a uh, tug with blood in his hands. And if he had blood in his hands, it was most likely his own. But um, he intervened, right? And he had the six men released. He took them out as far as uh, Danmire Station. Now, as I say, I had this first hand from Joe Graham. And he said, right, lads, he said, that's the way to Limerick. Now, pick off and keep going. And before he sent them off, he signed a safe pass for each one of the six. Now, as I say, I was told about this safe pass about 1980-something, right? And 20 years later, uh, John Joe O'Brien's son, Stan, showed me a copy of the safe pass. So it actually happened. Now, one thing I want to say is that no man did more to bridge the gap between the pro and anti treaty than Dan Breen, even though he's given, shall I say, a very bad press nobly. <laughs> um, as I said, the prisoners were released, right? Um, now, roll on March 1923. Green is captured in Ahalo. Uh, he's taken to Galway along with two ladies by the name of MacDonald, right? Now, uh, the two of the men involved, John Joe O'Brien and uh, Sean Lynch, decided to give Green <laughs> one bit of a shindy before he goes off to prison. And he prevailed on the uh, Free State OC in Galway, a fellow called Dick Ryan to uh, allow them to take him into O'Brien's pub, where he was, uh, let's say it, treated to a few pints. And in the meantime, 
the two McDonough sisters are outside in the lorry, <laughs> freezing, uh, waiting to, for the drinks to finish. Um, they were taken from there to Tipperary. Now, at that stage, the main barracks in Tipperary had been burned, and they were using Dobbins Hotel as a barracks. And the two ladies are taken up to this top story of the, of the hotel, uh, starving, uh, while bringing it down in the officer's mess, something bacon and cabbage. Um, now, as I say, the next uh, incident relates to Dan Grace. Now, Dan Grace was one of the few um, prominent uh, IRA men in East Limerick that went anti-treaty. Now, there were some, but not that many. The two Malones went anti-treaty, but on balance, the most of the East Limerick people went pro-treaty. And Grace was on a hunger strike in Limerick in August 1922. His younger sister, Mary Bridget, a fiery lady who later became a nun, decided to cycle to Limerick to visit her brother. And she got as far as Palace Green. Now she's living in Gary Doulis, and any of you that know Gary Doulis to Palace Green, she's, it's a very flat, uninteresting, boring landscape. And Mary Bridges anyhow gets as far as Palace Green, and she's stopped at a roadblock by uh, a free state officer called Morris Mead. And Morris Mead and Mary Bridges have a, an exchange of views, and Mead takes the bike. Of Mary Bridget. So she has no choice now but to walk back, as I say, towards Gary Douglas. On the way back, she's overtaken by two Free State officers in the car, uh, Sean Stapleton and Liam Hayes. <coughs> um, Hayes, uh, as I say, he had been one of the men released by Green. Um, Hayes stopped the car and they said to Mary, Mary Bridget, What are you doing? <laughs> and she, uh, when she came down, she told him that she had been going to visit her brother in Limerick on hunger strike, uh, but one of your monkeys took my bicycle off me. So they got her into the car, drove her back to Palace Green, placated Mead, took the bike off him, and drove her to Limerick. Now, in later years, um, Hayes uh, and, and Dan Grace uh, became very friendly. And when Dan Grace, who was the IRA pensions officer for East Limerick, when he was going to Dublin for uh, pension business with the PFR government, he would stay with Liam Hayes. Now, as I say, this, this is only a few years after the Civil War, 10 years after the Civil War, and a Free State officer and um, just a Republican are um, exchanging letters and, uh, you know, Staying with each other. <coughs> yeah. Um, keep going. Uh, next incident relates to uh, Sis Ryan, Packy Ryan, wife of Packy Ryan. Sis Ryan, Sis was her maiden name was Dunnigan, and they came from uh, near Doon. And her uncle and her father took the anti-treaty side during the Civil War. Now, the uncle was especially active, and he was eventually picked up by the uh, Free State, and he was jailed in, or interned in Garmentstown in County Meath. And um, when he was in, in Garmentstown, the younger brother, um, John, decided to take up cudgels for the Republic. One day he met uh, Sean Stapleton on the road. Now, Stapleton was a huge man. He, when he was still in his 40s, in the 1930s, he was playing full back for um, Solihead in the Tipperary, West Tipperary Hurling Championship. Now, it would be fair to say it was much easier to go over him than go around him. <laughs> um, anyhow, uh, Mary Bridget meets our uh, John meets John Stapleton, and Stapleton says to him, I see you're, you know, flexing your wings. Now he says, um, 
where's your brother? He says, above and gone is where you have first put him. Right, he said. And if you're not careful, you'll be up there with him. Now he says, when you're in Barnard Town, your father, he said, is an old man now. But when you're in Barnard Town, above with your brother, who's going to milk the cows then? That brought home the message. Um, now, the next incident relates to Dick O'Connell. Uh, the story was told to me by his nephew, Tom O'Donnell. Um, Dick, Dara said, had been the OC of the mid Limit Flying Column during the War of Independence. And his second in command was Sean Carroll from Castle Connell. Now, Sean Carroll is an extraordinary man because Sean Carroll is in his 40s. Sean Carroll was born in 1878. He played Holling for Limerick in the uh, All Ireland of 1910. As I say, by the time the War of Independence, he's well in his 40s. And um, a, after the truce, he took the anti treaty side. And he had a small flying column of about 13 to 15 men operating around East Limerick and mainly mid Tipperary. And um, <coughs> when Carl's men found out that Dick O'Connell, there I say it, was courting a girl in Lisnagrai. They decided to give him a welcome. Not very warm one, but um, and they had planned to shoot him. Now, when Carol found out, found the plans, he forbade it completely. Now, as I said, that information came to me from O'Connor's nephew, Tom O'Donnell. Um, he forbade it completely. And uh, Dick O'Connor, there I said, it was uh, <laughs> left to continue, continue his courting. Um, now, the next incident, which relates around the same time, also to Sean Carroll, uh, relate, relates in March 1923. Um, Morris Mead was captured by uh, Republicans in a shootout near Castle Connell. The same morning, young John Baggett had been killed. And um, Baggett's two older brothers had blood in the eyes. And Sean Cal realised that if they discovered that uh, Sean Mead, or Morris Mead was a prisoner, God nor a man wouldn't have saved Mead. So he decided to release him uh, in view of the fact that um, uh, Baggett's brothers would have uh, exacted full revenge. <coughs> um, now, the next incident relates really after the war, uh, Civil War. Two men in Valley Land were very active and both uh, on either side in the Civil War. Tom Crawford and Vinnie Krish. Crawford was Republican. Now, he has a unique record of distinction, whatever you want. He was wounded in the Civil War and in the War of Independence. And then I say it, he was wounded in the same place on the main street in Valley Landers. Now, um, the leading free stater in Valley Land was, was Denny Quish. Denny had a, a pub and a, an undertaking business. Now, Denny sold out in Valley and moved to, to the metropolis of, of Kilmallock. And every so often, Valley Land would be playing football matches in, in um, Kilmallock. And the young Crawfords would go up to Denny. With a very good cover for coming home, dare I say it, half torn. Um, and when they'd get home, and the father would see the condition of him, Ginny, uh, Ginny was asking Daddy. He insisted on, buy, uh, on buying us drink. <laughs> As I say. And the father would say, And how is Ginny? And that was the end of it. So that, that, um, there was a bond between, as I say, Ginny uh, Quish and uh, Tom Crawford. And they never, um, so it continued after the Civil War. Now, the last one relates to uh, an incident in West Limerick. And it was told to me by Eileen Doody. Um, uh, she's Eileen Fitzpatrick today. Uh, two families that lived on the either, either side of the stream, the Sheehys and the Doody's. Uh, Sheehy's went pro-treaty. 
Julius went anti-sweetie, but they never fell out. Um, and what she told me was that they used core together. Now, I say, uh, city people wouldn't probably understand the expression core. It's cooperate. They would say, hey, cut corn, go to the bog together. You know, they'd core together. And um, that was the situation with the she's and the doodies. Now, she said the only time they wouldn't uh, have any interaction it was at election time. He said the Dan Doody and Mick Sheehy would stay out of his way, each other's way, during election time, so that neither man would say the wrong thing to the other. Now, as I said, I thought it was uh, a nice kind of, um, you know, uh, consideration of the other person.